I drove right up here from uh, Kingston, New York uh, this morning, rode my motor motorcycle up, and um, it was probably the most beautiful ride I've had on a motorcycle in years. I left at 5 o'clock in the morning and came up on the Taconic Parkway, and there was, every valley had fog locked in it, and you would ride up and down, in and out of the fog, and when you were coming out of the fog, the sun would come right through in streams and just hit you. And also the air was heavy with everything that was in the woods around, so you have a lot of sense as you're driving. And I just felt how lucky I was and just how amazing it is to be able to have the amount of freedom that I have and the fortunate place that I live. And um, part of that fortunate place comes from working at Omega and being able to have the play that I have there with the amazing staff and the faculty that come through and the, the participants that come and the transformation that happens with people when they're on the Omega campus. But I was also thinking, you know, I walked in here and I was handed a glass of water. I didn't have to walk 80 miles to get the glass of water. It was right there handed to me nice and clean and fresh. I knew I wasn't going to get a disease from it. And I probably don't have to talk to all of you about where we are uh, in terms of the global situation. And my talk today is about me to we. And I just want to give a little context to that first. Um, where we are now in terms of sustainability, a lot of times when I do tours at Omega, the Omega Center for Sustainable Living, which is a building that actually recycles all of our wastewater on campus using nature's method for for reclaiming water with uh, microorganisms and plants. Most people come through and think of sustainability as environmental sustainability. And that's a track of sustainability. But sustainability, you have to consider the social and the economic piece of it. And when you look at adding in the economic and the social piece, understanding the environmental piece as we do, whether you want to call it global warming or climate change or whatever, you're faced with a rather daunting reality, um, whether you consider it um, the have and have nots, uh, where in this country the, the divide that's happened in the financial communities between uh, the, the vanishing of middle class is a lot of ways they say it, the growing uh, poor and homeless, the economic collapse that we've had in the country. But with globalization, we're much more aware of what else is happening in the world. And the, the difference between being able to get on my motorcycle and ride up the Taconic and stop and have breakfast, not have to go through a checkpoint, not be shot at, be able to have water when I get here is just profound compared to, compared to the way a lot of the world lives. And so that place of understanding how fortunate we are is sort of the jump off point for the me to we concept. It's understanding that you're all sitting here totally secure in this environment and you've had everything that you've experienced during your time during uh, Wanderlust. And the challenge is, what do you do with that experience? How do you live your life? And at what point does it become obvious to you that you are connected to everything else? A lot of what we're facing is really, the foundation of it is the disconnect points, whether it's environment or relationship. It's really the space between us and everything else. And I was thinking that when you're in Shavasana and you're in that final relaxation and you feel yourself sinking, that place emerges in you where you feel that level of connection. You feel that expansiveness. And so how do you live that more? How do you actually start to bring in that feeling of connection into your everyday life? And at Omega, we have really struggled in a lot of ways to sort of peel the onion apart and figure out how can we be the best living model of an integrated, interconnected, sustainable environment. And on the one hand, you know, from an envir environmental standpoint, we now have the Omega Center for Sustainable Living that gives you uh, an example of a LEED Platinum Living Building Challenge certified building. And the greenest building in the world is on the campus. We recycle, we compost all of our food. We have you know, 
all these things around clean cleaning products and everything we've done around that. And yet the challenge is really, how do we look at all the other components, the social and the economic? How do we get people to look at behavior change? How do we work on behavior change? And at Omega, we, the organization was founded under the idea of personal transformation, one person at a time, change the world, individual at a time. That concept of uh, was Gandhi that said, be the change you want to see in the world, individual at a time, which is absolutely the foundation of change. But we're in a period of time now where it needs to be accelerated. The process of approaching things one person at a time, we don't have that kind of time. And so um, what we're looking at at Omega is how do we jumpstart and understand how we can move forward in a more rapid way, and yet not in a way that is um, filled with friction and creates right and wrong and um, creates more negative energy than positive energy. So we're looking at how do we understand sustainability in the, in the full triad model, that social, economic, and environmental platform. And as I say, the, the environmental side is relatively easy because you decide where you're going to buy your food. And most of our food comes locally, and it's organic. And that's relatively clean and easy to do. And recycling is easy, and composting is easy. And you go down all those roads. And then you look at, well, where does the organization buy its pencils? Where does the organization buy its insurance policy? Where, all these various things. And then you look at one individual thing, and you think you understand where it comes from and what it is the consequence of having that one thing that you use at um, Omega, whether it be a pad of paper or an insurance policy or whatever. And that's what the Omega Center for Sustainable Living taught us, was that digging into where things come from and understanding the entire trail all the way back through where the actual raw material of that material good what was found, how was it mined, what was the treatment of the miners, how was it shipped to be the, made a, uh, at the factory. All the different steps have to be considered. And it winds up being this amazing mountain of information that you have to dig through. And it's almost impossible. And the challenge is when you really start to look at wanting to integrate those three components of sustainability, the amount of work that it takes is daunting. And so that's where looking to community to understand how to build sort of a platform that you can rest yourself in, that you, you can have the confidence that it's sustainable, um, is just a, it's a godsend to be able to do that. And that's one of the things we're trying to do at Omega is create a platform where people can come in, avail themselves of all the amazing teachers that come through, and yet are automatically in an environment that's done a lot of that lifting for, for you so that you can come in and you, it feels different. It, you can feel those points of connection. And you can actually you know, follow the use of your water. If you're in the, when you flush the toilet on Monday morning, by Tuesday afternoon, you can go down and stand next to the same water that you flushed away and see how it's been cleaned without any energy, no chemicals, and you see a complete hydrological cycle that you're a part of. And it's coming to the place of wanting to make it as transparent as possible to all the points of connection that we have every day, that we just start to you know, not quite understand and not quite relate to all the time. So we create what we call a container. And that container is the food. The container is the fact that there's no TVs in the rooms. The container is there's no phones in the room. Um, and the food is what it is, and there's meditation and yoga and the fact they come in. And another important component is that we have a, co a community that lives there, our seasonal staff community. And our seasonal staff community are there for a, a much longer period of time. They're there sometimes for almost seven months, whereas most participants come in and out for a weekend or a five day. And they establish that energetic that's there, that's living in that, in that way, in that relationship, in that community. And so the participants come in, and you can feel that. And it actually drops them into another place where they're learning in their personal 
transformation, the change that happens, the understanding that's, that happens is much easier because it's supported by that environment. So the, the me to we concept, and I've gotten a lot of people that have come to me and said, well, does the me to we mean I give up myself? The me to we concept is essentially that as you go through your life, there's a point where you realize that you're not alone. There's a point where you realize you have certain responsibilities. There's a point where you realize there is the other. Okay? And you know, I've lived in an ashram, and they've called it a lot of different things, from unified consciousness to cosmic consciousness. There's all these different things that happen. But in, in just plain language, it's just you start to develop awareness of the other. And once that starts to happen, that's when all the questions come in. How do I be? How do I actually work at this and, and be in this without my life being totally consumed? So I can still be myself, I can still be happy, I can still do all these things, even though there's all this disc discord in the world. So me to we is not about giving yourself up. In fact, it's more about being yourself. It's realizing that you have a greater responsibility to yourself. There's a way that you need to take care of, of yourself in order to be in those relationships. You have to take care of your health. It's clear, okay? How you decide what you're going to buy, where you're going to live, what's your work going to be, all those things impact that broader way. At the same time, they're building your own place of happiness and satisfaction. That works back and forth. It's a reciprocal relationship. It's not one or the other. It could be me and we. But the reason why we say me too we is because we're trying to move somewhere. We're trying to move consciousness from a place where there's a, almost a energetic block that needs to be shifted to that inclusion of the other to help dissolve some of those blocks, those interconnections that are not happening. So often you can think, um, why is it different than any other time in human history that right now is uh, so difficult a time or we, we feel so almost desperate at times in the condition, global conditions? And the way I look at it is because this is the first time that we have an end in sight. There's a finite point between um, the global carrying capacity of the Earth the number of people that can live on the earth, the amount of minerals that there are, the amount of water that the, there is, our ability to grow food. Already you see food prices escalating. Already you see wars over water. You certainly have everything that's going on around energy. So there's, a, there's actually a visible end that I feel calls for an acceleration of each one of us stepping up to that responsibility and understanding how we become that me to we, that point of, of connection. When you came in, you all got a dollar bill. And it wasn't just to pay you to come. You know? <laughs> so, um, so if you take your dollar bill out, and on the dollar bill, and you've probably all heard this a 100 times, there's the Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, on the dollar bill. Okay? And it's right in the top of the pyramid. Um, and what that means is, out of the many, one. And now, our government meant that originally as here's all these states that have come together and we're, and we're all working as one, and that's the union as we know it, the United States. But if you think about the concept as out of the many, one, and you realize that that dollar that's in your hand is one of the most powerful tools that you have. What you decide to do with that dollar, it's yours to keep. You don't have to give it back, OK? It's, it's, not, it's not anything like that. It's not a bait and switch here or anything. You get to keep the dollar. But what you decide to do with the dollar is one of those ways that you have impact, probably one of the largest ways you have impact. Where you buy your food, where are you going to go next, what are you going to spend that dollar on, where did the shirt come from that you spent that dollar on, where did the head of broccoli come from that you bought? Okay, when you're traveling somewhere, how are you getting there? Okay, are you going to give that dollar to some organization to help in some cause that you're passionate about? Your relationship to money is one of your most powerful tools in this country. This is a country based on supply and demand. If we demand change, it will change. But you have to use your money to make that demand happen. It's great to think that ener energy makes the change. 
And it does at a certain level. But you have to channel that energy in different ways. One of the ways is right through that dollar. And not just purchases that you make, but in the lobbying that you do around what you want to see to purchase and support your life. You all have cell phones. I'm sure everybody here has a cell phone. You don't. Wow, OK. <laughs> One. So when you have your cell phone, at some point that cell phone dies. And you buy another cell phone. And at that point, what happens? You have to buy another charger. You have to buy another dock for your computer. It goes on and on and on. The charger and the cell phone that you had before are in a landfill somewhere that'll be there for the rest of your life and the rest of your kid's life. Okay? So part of how you spend your money is, why don't we demand that there's one plug that's going to fit all cell phones? Okay? The only reason why there are multiple plugs is because of supply and demand and the capital market. Because there's somebody making money off of every time you change your cell phone and buy that other charger or that other laptop docking station or whatever it is. And so you have a tremendous amount of power to be able to make change happen. So the dollar bill and how you spend it, if not the most powerful, one of the most powerful. The next, the, between one and two, and I go back and forth with this, is how you, have, how you have handle your disposition in life. How do you walk in life? Do you walk listening? Do you walk quickly? Um, do you interact from a place of grace? Or are you unaware of what's happening around you? We are doing a lot of work in mindfulness now, a lot in education and trainings and bringing teachers in. And I've worked with Technohan um, and sat with him to the point where I thought I was going to go out of my mind from sitting still for so long. And I've meditated in Brazil for four hours at a time with uh, Medium Zhao, John of God. Um, and it's very hard to be conscious as you're walking down the street. And it's very hard to look at every single person and understand that you're in relationship with everything. You're in relationship with everybody that walks by you. You're in relationship with the floor. You're in relationship with the sky. Because it gets to be overwhelming after a while. But as you can release into that and sort of lean back into it, you just walk open. You're open as you're walking. And how you carry yourself and how you think probably is number one, and maybe money is number two, OK, in how you can impact change. I recently um, did an exercise. I've been with Omega for over 30 years. And I went back to some of our first catalogs. And we had Ram Das there, and Amory Lovins, and I forget who else was in this one workshop. And it was all about social action. Ram Das was all revved up, and he was like, you know, we have to, 1980, we have to make change now. The, the world's going down the drain. It's all going to be over in five years. We need action now. So that's 1980. We're now sitting in 2011. And the language from then was very much the same as I found myself sitting in at some of the talks that I give. And yet the difference is that end in sight. And we really do need to turn up the volume. And we need to speak about the world that we want to see. And I keep thinking of that movie. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Spinal Tap. You know, when they, have, when they, when they turn it up to like 11, you know? And, and we, everybody needs to find their 11, OK? Whatever it is that you need to do to find 11, that's what your work should be. Find your 11 so that you're, you're able to make the move and, the, and what's necessary happen. And it's not, it's not that you can't relax in that. I mean, this is my, my big lesson. I'm turning 60 in less than a month. And I felt like I've lived my life on this freight train that was just you know, going down you know, from the anti-war movement in uh, 67 uh, through like 72 to the environmental movement. I've just been on this train. And I'm just learning now how to get off the train and yet still be working, and still be working in, and towards what I'd like to see and also working on myself. So um, yoga, I think, is one of the great ways to get yourself off that train. A regular practice is a great way to get yourself off that train. Because you need to take care of yourself. You need to be able to rejuvenate. Because everything that's coming at you is not in that same harmonic place. And so for your own health, you need that practice. So 
I was reading, um, I get this magazine called The Week. It's the only thing that I use to keep me up on more or less the right and left politics of things. And there's a big article in there that I read last night that the sun is not going to have as many sun uh, eruptions, sun, sunspots this year. And the theory is that we're now moving into a 70-year cycle of rapid cooling. Um, it happened, the last time was in 1600s, and it lasted for 70 years. And so I can already hear everybody that's been on the side of, you know, global warming is just garbage and it's not happening, all these things, that because temperatures, if the scientists are right, are going to take a dip, okay? And yet, the reality that's going to be going on behind that phenomenon is still the loss of resource the overpopulation, the loss of water, the loss of resource. So one of the challenges that we're gonna face in the next number of years is to keep being able to articulate the truth of the situation and carry that truth in our everyday. And your friends, your family, your politicians, no matter what you think about politics in this country, I can tell you it makes a difference. Omega now has a lobbyist, a phrase I never thought I would utter. And we have a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., and we have a lobbyist in Albany. And why? Because I don't know if it's going to make a difference, but I sure want our voice of sanity there. I sure want to have somebody in there saying what we're thinking. And when we built the Omega Sustain Center for Sustainable Living, it made a difference. We actually got more funding that we wouldn't have gotten. And we're now producing Technohan in Washington, D.C., and part of the work that we're going to do is a session with the joint session of, of Congress for them to come and hear um, being mindful. Um, so politics is not out of the realm or is not taboo in how you work to move this forward. Well, just in, in, in closing to it, because it's hard to do this in 10 minutes because there's a, an amazing amount of details behind everything that um, it's, think about what you're going to do with the dollar and don't just go buy a cup of coffee with it. Think about it. and. Um, Hold on to it for a little while, okay? So I'll take any question anybody might have. Yes? I'm just wondering, I didn't know that you guys had lobbyists in Washington and Albany. I think that's amazing. And I know that you guys are a 501c3 organization. Yes. So besides the 501c3 and the 501c4, I know that differentiation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of remaining bipartisan and not getting yourselves in trouble or so forth, yeah. um, my question is, would you guys ever think about harnessing the power of social media with the newsletter or something that you feel is effectively green to offer a voice of Omega? Because I don't know if a lot of people understand that Omega goes way beyond offering workshops during the summer, that you guys actually have a position. And it's a very strong position, and it's a very well-respected position, and you have an incident of lesser and a lot of powerful voices on your side. How would you feel about starting a newsletter? And I'll volunteer my 12 to help you if you like. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, actually, uh, the, we're in a process right now uh, uh, for my staff that are here, you'll be hearing this, so, <laughs> uh, of establishing a social media division at Omega and looking at um, how we're going to communicate the wisdom and knowledge that we've accumulated over 30 years and the, the cast of characters, if you will, that um, have assembled themselves around Omega. The challenge in it is to, um, and what's very important to me is how to be very active and driven without a lot of bodies on left along the way. Um, I really believe that there's a continuum of consciousness and it's not, I always hold my hands up like this, but maybe it's like this, I don't know. The, it's not that any one is better or more than the other place where somebody is. And one of the important things at, at Omega is to be able to be open to people at point of entry. So taking a position becomes sometimes hard while holding that open space for people to come into because position tends to exclude even if you think you're 100% right. No matter what you believe, it could be the, the truth sent down in a lightning bolt. And you will still have people that are not going to um, hold it the same way. And then at the same time, and you're gonna, this is my internal conversation now, at the same time, I can't wait for those people, okay? I have to move 
as strong and as hard as possible. And yep, there's going to be some people that don't come for the ride, and somebody else will come along and pick them up. And that's a constant conversation all the time. But you will see, um, I'm using the phrase rebooting Omega lately. And um, so you will see, I always say it in a shorter time frame than my staff would, so um, probably within the next eight to 10 months, um, a rebooting of Omega in terms of a stepping out in position. Um, because we believe that it's necessary and that hopefully there won't be too many bodies left on the side. No. There's another question over here, yes? Um, you had said that there were three things, or maybe I misunderstood you in there one too, but three things that kind of condone or promote transformation and capital was one, and then the second one you are saying you're positioning. Was there a third? Or no, the, the, what I was saying that when I think about sustainability, it's, it's a triad. It has to do, if you have the economic, you have the social, and um, the environmental. Um, there's a long list. There's, there's about 50 things on the list of, that you can consider as, as life work and, and life, uh, the way that you choose to be. Um, and I think um, that way of holding, your, the way of holding yourself, it's, a, it's almost, you know, in yoga, you're all about posture in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, standing up, okay, and you know, having clear eyes, clear vision, being that, being that light, and being open in that way. I think I will from now on say is number one. Number two is how you use your capital, and your capital being the, your dollars. Any any other way, you know, understand what you're doing. If you've just bought a flat screen TV, you just took fifteen thousand gallons out of the water flow forever. So you don't need more than one. Okay, and how many phones, how many cars, what kind of car, what do you eat, you know, how do you get from point A to point B? Do you know your neighbor? Do you know your neighbor's name? Do they have kids? Do you know the kids? You know, I mean, all those ways of being, you know, matter. So, so it wasn't, the, the, the three were the triangle of how I think about sustainability. The, the rest is just life challenge. We have one over here, yes? Would you say that, given the interconnectedness of everything that you were talking about, and you know, from where something is shipped, that you could get nervous about um, what the implications of something you might do is? We use the example of the universal cell phone charger, but it could be complicated if, say, you lobby for one of those and it creates this monopoly that somehow, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean, and and that's the challenge. Yeah. First of all, don't make yourself crazy, um, because I, I almost wound up there when we were building the, sustainable, the Omega Center for Sustainable Living. There were thousands of parts in it, and uh, there was a, it's a good thing there was a, a friendly bar on the way home, because <laughs> it, it was the only way I let go of a lot of the stress, because when you start to peel things apart, it's, it's really almost impossible. And I'll give you one quick example. One of the things in the uh, living building challenge is that all the materials have to come within a given radius around the building. Uh, steel and uh, all heavy things have to come from within 500 miles. So on the one hand, you think that really makes sense because the trucks have to take this big material and drive it over and all these things. But on the other hand, if you stop and think, all right, what if within 500 miles, all of the steel manufacturing places, which in the Rust Belt, we're in the Northeast, were built in the 1950s. And 1,000 miles away, there's a brand new steel plant that's gas-fired, that has very low emissions, that's working at a much higher level of efficiency. Well, now, that whole idea of buying local makes absolutely no sense. So what do you do? Okay, because your buy local is just thrown out the window. And a lot of things are like that. Especially, you know, if, you're, if your goods are shipped by rail, okay? You can go a lot further out in carbon footprint by rail than you can by car or by truck, okay? But when you buy that phone charger, what are you gonna do? You're gonna sit there and say, well, did, you know, can you tell me that this gets shipped here by boat, plane, or truck, you know, when you're in the store, you know? It's not gonna happen. But you can take the time to understand, how can I recycle this phone, okay? 
and you can take little steps into it. And hopefully, you know, with pressure, we can make those changes happen so that the answers are easier to find. You know, there's a, um, a, a, a major beverage company now that I won't mention that has declared they are going to save the, and cure the world's water problem. And there's a lot of whitewashing going on right now. You know, business has adopted sustainability as you know, sort of the next marketing um, advantage. And so you have to be careful um, that you're seeing what it really is about. Um, I mean, when you think about bottled water being, anyway, I'll get way off here. So <laughs> um, it's an easy wrap up. I just, this is great. Normally I, I would talk to much larger groups and I, I don't have this level of connection. And um, if anyone has any other questions outside of this forum, I'll be over there for a little while. So thank you all for taking this time and I hope you spend your dollar wisely. <laughs>